This won't be the last time a child dies in U.S. custody uh, trying to seek asylum with their family. For the second time this month, an underage migrant has died in U.S. custody. U.S. Customs and Border Protection said late yesterday that an eight-year-old girl at a Border Patrol facility in Texas experienced a medical emergency and later died. CBP is investigating the incident. The announcement came just days after the end of the pandemic era program known as Title 42. Officials say the number of encounters with migrants crossing the U.S.-Mexico border has fallen by more than half since last week. We're joined now by Kika Matos. Wow, that's interesting. Title 42 ends and the amount of migrants crossing into the United States decreases. Everybody was acting like we're going to have like wave after wave after wave of migrants coming into the United States. President of the National Immigration Law Center. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. And we should say the Associated Press reports that the little girl who died was from Panama <laughs> and that she had heart problems. Uh, she had surgery for those heart problems in Panama and that she crossed with her father, mother, and two older siblings. And the facility where she and her family were being detained sits on one of the busiest corridors for migrant crossings. Separate from this specific case, tell us about these facilities. Can they... If our immigration laws were better, more geared towards actually helping these people, this child would have gotten some medical care for her obvious, or, well, probably not, obvious but, but the, the 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 parents would have been able to tell people yeah or your child has uh, a heart condition um and she would have gotten checked out and she probably would still be alive adequately address the manifold issues that that families and children present with yeah first my heart goes out to uh the family of that little girl uh, I was in the border just last week witnessing the end of Title 42 uh, and the impact of the asylum ban that the Biden administration has imposed. Um, what I will tell you about the uh, Customs and Border uh, Patrol facilities is that they are like black boxes. Um, lawyers don't have access to them. Advocates don't have access to them. And we know that the conditions right now are extremely overcrowded. The history of CBP facilities are um, stories of inhumane uh, conditions that no human being should ever have to confront. Before Title 42 was lifted, U.S. officials said that they were preparing for as many as 11,000 people crossing the border a day. At the end of Title 42, encounters dropped to less than 5,000 people. What accounts for that? I don't know the answer to that, but I will tell you um, that I was in the border last week and what I saw uh, were thousands of uh, migrants following the regulations that were imposed by the United States government, patiently waiting for their appointments. Look at all these criminal uh, criminals trying to, you know, rush the border and break into the United States and their invasion. Yeah. Uh, this is funny. It, it, it's just, it's just funny how, like, how much fear, fear mongering there is over, uh, migrants coming into the United States. And this is how they're acting. They're following, uh, laws to get into the United States and the port of entry. This is all what these people want. They just want help. Give them help. And yeah, they won't have to climb over the, uh, border in order to get into the United States seeking help. On the Mexican side of the border, uh, there was a lot of lack of information, misinformation, disinformation. Um, when we talked to a lot of the migrants, what we heard was stories of people fleeing desperate conditions, grabbing their families and running for their lives uh, to the border so that they could present themselves lawfully to seek asylum in the United States. There are people who say that the ability for, for migrants to, to show up on U.S. soil and apply for asylum, that that process is, is sacrosanct, and that the administration, both with their deterrence policies and now establishing alternate routes for people to claim asylum in-country,
that that r runs afoul of, of U.S. values, of American values. How do you see it? Well, not just of uh, U.S. values where anybody and everybody should be able to come to the United States in order to, you know, have a better life and, you know, go from rags to riches. It's law to, to help these people when they're seeking asylum. Um, so, besides, you know, U.S. law, or what it used to be where the U.S. was required to help asylum seekers, uh, it's international law and U.N. law. And the United States is still a signatory of the uh, asylum laws that the U.N. has proposed and passed. It not only runs afoul of U.S. values and what we stand for as a nation, it is also in violation of our own domestic laws and our own obligations under international law. So I'm That's hilarious because that's just what I said and I didn't even know she was going to say that. But uh, yeah, uh, the United States has to have the United States has to give asylum seekers um, the ability to come into the United States, process them, see if they have a valid claim, and give them help if they do. Under the U.S. law, anybody who seeks asylum has a right to come to the U.S. and present themselves, whether they do it at an airport, whether they do it at a port of entry, whether they cross the border and do it. We have an obligation. Y yeah, um, even the uh, U.N. law says that it doesn't matter how these people get into the get into a nation that has asylum protections. If they request asylum, they have to be processed for that. And under U.S. laws and our our own allegiance to international laws to do that. This asylum ban, uh, and I'm using those words intentionally, makes it impossible for people to access political asylum in the United States. What did the asylum bans is actually um, a violation of uh, international laws, and I'm it's it's surprising that the like international community isn't like rallying against this. I mean, I guess they don't care that much with other things going on, but the UN should be speaking about this. It appears those policies are working. Is there another way that you can achieve both goals? We have an obligation to allow people to present themselves to seek asylum. That does not mean that everybody who seeks asylum to the United States should be granted asylum. We have an obligation to follow our own domestic laws. I should also note that we have a deeply broken immigration system. The last time we saw comprehensive immigration legislation take place in this country, was in 1986 under, Donald, uh, under Ronald Reagan. What that means is that we have for decades dealt with a deeply broken immigration system that has very few avenues for people to legally come into the United States. We hear a lot from people saying, well, why can't they do it illegally? The truth of the matter is that our system is broken and Congress refuses to act. Yeah, it, actually, the the more laws that are put in place to like restrict immigration, the the worse it actually becomes, because then people are unable to exit the United States, so they get so they get stuck in the United States as undocumented workers or something, when previously, the flow of people going in and out was pretty steady, and these people wouldn't stay here that long but when you make these restrictions it traps people here um good video to watch is uh adam ruins everything about immigration uh that will tell you everything you want to know about how broken our system actually is for a long time border crossers were mostly single men and that has shifted over time to include families and unaccompanied children have our policies, have the resources, have the, the, the infrastructure along the southern border adequately shifted to account for that change? 
No, look, I spent four days last week in the border, and we met with people who are on the Mexican side of the border, waiting patiently to be given appointments. We visited encampments. We visited shelters. We met with families. We met with families with young children. These encampments, the conditions in these encampments are deplorable. They are inhumane. There is no basic infrastructure. In one encampment that we went to, there were two porta potties for approximately 1,200 people. A lot of the people who are in these encampments rely on humanitarian assistance from nonprofit organizations that are cobbling resources together to try to meet very basic needs. We have an obligation. We could easily use some of the military resources that we have to help these people uh, integrate more into society besides just, you know, processing these people and giving them a social security number, making them citizens and, you know, uh, fulfilling the labor or uh, reducing the labor shortage that we supposedly have. I mean, seriously, if we do have a labor shortage, why not? allow these people to come into the United States and work? We have the resources, we have the ability to provide infrastructure so that these families, while they wait to be processed, have the very basic standards that human decency requires, and we're not providing that as a government.